a very warm welcome to everyone um, that has joined us so far. Um, we're really pleased to see you. Thanks for introducing yourself um, in the chat questions. My name is Grant Ballard Tremere, and I'm going to be running the training session today. As we go, um, I'll try and guide you through the process and help with the various tools that we have available to to us. Let's get going. I've got a lot to cover um, in the in the session um, today. Um, the subject of market barrier analysis is really very very large, very broad, um, and we are going to try and have, I guess you could call it a lightning tour through the topic. I want to talk about what market barriers are, um, why they're important, um, what is important about them. And my intention is to make sure that you really understand and appreciate the importance of um, market barriers, the many ways that there are to examine and communicate market barriers, and also motivated to explore the market analysis benefits and appropriate actions more and approaches that can, you can use um, for, for market barrier analysis. And just to get started, this little image uh, reminds me of work that um, I did a number of years ago to um, make an evaluation of a number of projects in, in a particular country. And we, at that time, were able to travel I went on a site visit and went in and visited a biogas system that had been set up in um, a, a farmer's home um, that allowed farmer and his family to take the waste from animals, the dung, and put it into the system and create gas from that and using the gas in order to cook. So provided ability to cook and also the, the, the waste that comes from the biogas once it's been di from the um, from the dung once it's been digested is an extremely good fertilizer. So, so at first sight, this is a fantastic, interesting project. But as I was there discussing it with the with, with the donor of this particular project, it became clear that there are some, a number of factors that hadn't been taken into account. This was a fantastic project. It, it looked so beautiful. It was shiny. It was clean. There was a nice logbook that we could fill in. But a simple calculation said that the payback for this, the amount of savings, were about 100 years. I mean, something really a very, very long time um, for the investment to, to, to be paid back. So this was an example of a project that had been taken forward without paying um, attention to the question of the market barriers. What stops this great technology from being um, distributed and grown in a sustainable way in this particular country for this particular market segment? That having into account, it was a demonstration program. It showed what could be done, but it was not something that could ever be scaled up as it was. What would be the effects? It would make more people want to get the same sort of um, gift because it's not something that could be affordable in that stage. So market barriers are important to consider because it's a fundamental characteristic of a project that if it addresses market barriers, it can produce a, um, a, a lasting result. And if it doesn't produce market barriers, what we often say is that it like bulldozes through the barriers. It doesn't actually remove them, but it just addresses them with, in this case, lots of money. Then it's able to produce a result. There were impacts of the project. There was a nice biogas digester, but no change in the overall market. If you look at various funds, um, the NAMA facility is one of those examples. They state in the guidance notes for the NAMA facility that the creed criteria um, for the Project Rationale is a comprehensive market area analysis that clearly shows the current sector situation and what impedes transformational change. Um, so that idea of the, of the barrier analysis and as a key criteria um, for it is, is really um, a fund for, for um, for, for a NAMA facility project. Well, what about the Green Climate Fund? Um, some of their text 
on on it. This has just taken a sort of a, a section, little section from the programming guide from, from July 2020. The guide says that through the theory of change, this is the diagram and narrative that describes why you believe that change will take place as a result of the project. The GCF, the Green Climate Fund, and the ITAP, which is the Independent Technical Advisory Panel reviewers, they understand how the project intends to remove the barriers that prevent transformative change and how the action promotes a paradigm shift. If any of you are involved in, in doing um, GCF uh, projects, you'll know the paradigm shift is one of its key investment criteria. And the idea of barrier removal and how a project removes barriers to prevent that transformative change is, is a fundamental factor there. Right, so um, hopefully, um, you know, you, you can appreciate the, the necessity to have a look at barriers. I just thought it might be useful to dig in a little bit more to understand what we mean by barriers. And for that, I'm proposing to do um, something that is called the exercise exercise. Um, so have a look at this poll, which asks you um, the exercise exercise related to knowledge. Three different options. One is I know that getting exercise is very important. I have heard many advertisements about promoting good health through exercise. So this, this is the first one. If this one matches best with your own knowledge about exercise, select that option. If the um, second one is I have only heard that exercising can reduce your chance of getting ill, choose that second option. And if it's the third one, then say, I, that it's, I know that many people are in shape because they're exercised, but I'm not sure how they do it. Choose the third option. So which one matches better with, with your knowledge about exercise? We've so far got 18 people, 19 people have responded on the first option there. Um, on second option, one person and three people on the third. Okay. So um, I'm now going to launch the second um, of these little polls, which is on beliefs. Now we're looking at the exercise, exercise beliefs, and the questions many of you have already answered. The first one is, I believe that getting exercise is very important. I think that everyone should exercise regularly at, four, at least four times a week. The second option is, I believe exercise is somewhat important. Most people should exercise one or two times a week. And the third option there is, I think we should get enough exercise with routine activities for the day. So that's the second um, option there. The next one is around, you probably guessed it, is around the actual practice. So what is your view of the practice of exercise. The three options are firstly, um, okay, let's get the poll out. Um, so, th three options for the practice one um, is last week I exercised at least four times for at least 30 minutes at a time. Um, the second one I exercised twice last week. And thirdly, I did not exercise at all. I can see lots of quick. Um, responses coming there. Wow, we've got a heart, healthy um, healthy group here. Um, at least 40% uh, so far um, have actually executed, exercised at least four times. Well, I guess you can see already um, the, the differences here. We have, um, for knowledge, the poll results showed that around 80% felt that exercise was very important. I mean, in terms of belief, uh, we had around 65% saying exercise is very important and 30% saying somewhat important. But when you actually get round to practice, many of us with the best of intentions don't end up exercising. I guess particularly at the moment, many of us are still in lockdown um, situations um, because of the COVID um, pandemic. So the um, situation is that the practice doesn't fully match with reality of what we do and knowledge and belief is not enough to 
motivate part of understanding barrier. In, in this case, this exercise comes from the whole field of behavioral change. Um, and the within behavioral change science, there's a whole method which is around understanding barrier analysis. And it's barriers to certain types of behavior. It's one of the tools that we sometimes use um, for it. And I will, when we send the webinar kit around, I'll we'll send around um, a link where you can get more information about how to do this type of, um, this type of analysis, um, where you um, look at the various reasons that people don't exercise. It's not just to have knowledge. Awareness is not sufficient. It's not just to even believe that you want to do something. But there's something more around practice. And if we are wanting to bring about a change in a particular situation in a country, um, the understanding of the barriers, what stops people from doing it, what stops you yourself from exercising, for example, is part of that understanding um, of, of market barriers. That's the, the, the practice of market barriers. Here is a photograph um, from Central Asia, a solar cooker is one of the tools that have been used to address deforestation and the shortage of wood and the amount of time that is used to collect wood. Um, and why not use the sun? It's free. We can focus the sun's rays on a pot. Here is an example of it. Well, there's been millions invested in developing the solar cooking market um, around the world in many different countries. And there's very little to show for it. Here we see a practical example, not just with exercise, but with practice. So, well, there are, there are barriers that stop a certain change in a certain type of behavior. And, and, and this, is, this is one of those um, examples. We will now do is outline the project development process. When we design a project, we start off the work doing a baseline assessment. Um, this is the starting point. And you probably, if you've designed um, projects to bring about a, a, a market transformation, you will have come across many of these different aspects. And in the baseline assessment, we include um, the um, stakeholder review, um, stakeholder policy, stakeholder sector review, a policy analysis like that. Um, we also um, um, look at a policy or an institutional analysis, um, a capacity and awareness assessment. And all of these are aspects of what we call barrier analysis. So they're all um, components of, of barrier analysis. Um, the second step using that baseline is we then um, develop a strategy. And that is the strategy development side. So the barrier analysis is used as an input to um, a strategy development. And there are a number of different tools that we might use there, results, frameworks, and theories of change. Um, we mentioned the theory of change earlier, solution trees or future reality trees, outcome challenges and business models. These are tools that we use in order to determine what strategies um, would best be, be used um, for the, to address the market and to address the market barriers. And the third step is right, to write the project, to design the project itself. And we develop a range of different um, sections of a proposal. And each of these builds on the strategy that we've developed and builds on the baseline that has been developed based on the different types of reviews that have been taking place. These aspects mean that we now really give a definition of what barrier analysis is. It's an assessment tool that identifies and analyzes obstacles that prevent movement or change. Um, so we use this to identify the obstacles that prevent the change. This could be personal change, like exercise or the use of a cooker, or they could be institutional and sector-wide change that we're looking at. Um, and the barrier analysis includes two parts. One is explanations of the present status quo and an understanding of reasons for the lack of change.
these are two two aspects that um, are part of that right so now i'm going to get into the details of the tools that we can use um, for barrier analysis the tools that you can see on the outside here there's stakeholder mapping market mapping value chain analysis impact chain analysis market system analysis needs assessment behavioral change analysis problem tree and feasibility studies and environmental and social impact assessments these are some of those tools that we might use and on the inside um, curve of this um, screen you'll see um, some of the methods that are used in order to gather the information and collect the data that is needed in order to use um, these different tools and i'm going to talk now about um, a number of them not all of them but i'm going to give you um, a quick insight into some of them firstly we'll talk about about stakeholder analysis um, and how to and, and how we identify barriers within the context of that and stakeholder analysis often use interviews that's a tool that um, we, we use reviews and interviews these sorts of um, approaches to gathering the data for stakeholder analysis um, then i will give some examples of well of, of these three but these three aspects that is the market mapping value chain analysis and impact chain analysis i'm going to go into um, some detail about those then i will talk a little bit about the problem tree analysis that's one of the the main tools that are used for analysis of barriers so i'll give um, some examples of how that works so dig into the various different approaches and tools firstly um, the stakeholder analysis here you can see a, um, a sheet that we use for interviews so you would hold an interview it could be online in these days but in the past it would be face to face um, with different types of stakeholders you can see in the top left of the screen the stakeholder name is is given and we would um, specify who the stakeholder is and through the interviews we would have gathered information around these four different columns um, of information normally we would carry out an interview and then after the interview analyze the responses of each of the stakeholders to understand these four different factors the factors are their vision about the, their role in the sector what they see as the key challenges in the in the third column of this of this table in the fourth column we put how are the challenges experienced so how do they themselves experience and how do those constrain action and in the fifth column what in their opinion are the prospects for change so this is a way of taking the interview and digesting or analyzing and synthesizing the findings from the interview to understand um, the challenges from the perspective of each of the stakeholders. They will raise different issues. So for each of those challenges they have, I'll, you'll see I put stars next to some of them. Um, for example, this first one um, around um, star not having sufficient time for to develop and implement plans is a star there because this applies, it's a challenge that they identified that the local authority in this case identified um, which relates to them so those that relate to them are marked with a um, a, a, a little star there and then we have um, a number of other ones in fact none of these are relating to any other stakeholders in the interview they raised many different issues there <clears throat> this helps us to get the perspective of different stakeholders um, on the project. So this is a stakeholder analysis um, approach to understanding the market and market barriers. Once we have analyzed the market from the stakeholders, or in some cases, um, instead of doing that type of analysis, we use tools that um, are described here on the right um around market mapping 
um, value chain analysis or impact chain analysis. And all of these tools are part of the bigger area of science, which is the market systems analysis. These are different types of tools and we will send you some information around each of these different approaches that are used. This is an example of a sort of a market chain. It's that perspective of understanding how the market of this type of diagram is to start with any one of the suppliers or even the users and ask them where they get certain types of equipment, if it's technology oriented, or where they receive training or where they receive information and maintenance. So you say, where do we get these um, aspects? For the end user or you could start with a supplier this is a supplier of, of some particular product or service for example an irrigation system where does the, the supplier get different different inputs how does the supplier get the inputs that she or he needs in order to um, provide the products to the end users and we just follow this sort of map when i do field work i'm there in interviews having discussions with people filling in this type of stakeholder matrix between the interviews and drawing a diagram i start on a blank sheet of paper and i start drawing a diagram of how everything works and as i go through each interview i can then dig in further to understand how it all fits together um, you'll see we've got suppliers and the end users in this diagram up at the top there is the social and legislative framework. And this provides the market environment in which the, the, the project takes place. And there are supporting services. They don't actually handle the product. Say it's a drip irrigation system. They don't handle the product, but they provide services to various suppliers on the way, banks, investors, universities, trainers, donors, NGOs. These are supporting, supporting services that you can see in blue. So I, I start to build up this picture and it really helps me to get a good understanding of who supplies whom and how all these different aspects work. Often then I have to redraw it in many different ways. Here you can see a sort of a simplified diagram of that same um, picture that I showed you. And here um, appearing are different market barriers. These are the market barriers shown in the octagonal lines here. So um, this is policymakers, and it, it's written in short here. The need that the policymakers are expressing are around strategies to enable the market. Essentially, policymakers don't know how, in this particular case, to enable the market. For finance, um, one of the barriers has to do with how to understand and assess the risks. So that is sort of the second aspect to it. Um, for suppliers, you can see the three arrows pointing into the suppliers. We have here access to capital. Um, we have technical and business skills and um, awareness of opportunities. So suppliers don't know that there's an opportunity for this aspect and then thirdly really barriers that apply to the end users so you'll see here we're still using a, a stakeholder oriented um, approach to looking at the barriers but understanding how and in a simplified diagram how each of these are addressed and in the square boxes that are that are drawn in on the on on, on the left and right of the screen you can see um, a number of different pol um, project activities that could be um, put in place, for example, microfinance here, or training and capacity building here. You can see how these address the market barriers. So that's that perspective that we're trying to look for. So it's a type of market system diagram. And here you can see market system diagram um, that has been developed, in fact, not by us. Um, this was done by a practical action shows uh, this type of market map um, showing the market chain and actors, the supporting services and the enabling environment that provides these services within that area. So that is this whole area of tools around market mapping, 
value chain analysis. I have not said anything about the impact chain yet. Impact chain is usually something that we do when we're developing an adaptation-oriented project. So the idea is that at the top of this diagram here, this section is the, is the climate hazards that are experienced. And these are the climate hazards up at the top. So these are hazards here. And underneath the hazards are the impacts. So this is the, this is the impact area, the second level down. And here is the risk that we are working at. It's the risk of water scarcity for smallholder farmers. This risk is exacerbated by these hazards, by the impacts that these hazards have. Too low precipitation means insufficient water available for irrigation. Um, this is this causal chain related to an adaptation project. And when we um, take yeah, hazards to impact to the risk, and look at the next stage of trying to understand what stops this, or what causes this problem, what stops this problem from being addressed. We look at the sensitivity and vulnerability. We say what aspects of this system, this is the system on the, on the left of the screen, what aspects are um, of the vulnerability of the system contribute to the increased risk? In this case, we might say the unfavorable soil, the unsuitable land use, um, low efficiency of the irrigation system, high water um, demand of crops. These are acts of the system that contribute to the impacts there. So you can see that the arrow showing it here. And on this side, we have identified the um, really the aspects of adaptive capacity, that's what they talk about in, in adaptation uh, literature. But these are market barriers. These are the same type of market barriers that we've been talking about before. So within, within the context of an ad adaptation project, we identify these sorts of market barriers. And here's just a, a few of them. So we use the same sort of tools to understand what are those aspects that are contributability to climate change. I will just um, then briefly cover one more aspect of the tool that we use, and then I will um, do um, as much as I can to address the questions there. What I would like to cover now is the problem tree analysis. It's a very well known um, mechanism. We'll send some information around it just in case it's new to you. But we use this in order to um, develop. Um, a, <clears throat> an overall tree of the and understand the root causes or the sort of current reality that people are experiencing. I'm just going to show you through uh, the, the process that we go through in order to um, develop it. We start normally with what we call is the core problem. And in this case, the core problem is, is shown here. It's, it's, it's the core of the project problem. It's the, it's the heart of it. And we identify um, a particular problem that we are looking to address. It's important in your core problem to make sure that it's, it's um, a negative issue. You want to start off with a problem. It needs to be climate related. Um, it's very important if you're developing climate project that it's a climate related core problem um, that you identify. We make it as specific as possible and it should be something that is solvable. And then for the core problem, we ask particular questions. We say there's a high intensity of urban buildings. Um, so um, that is the core problem in this particular example. And um, we say, why? Why is there a high intensity? And you'll see that there are two, two blocks that are, are pointing to this particular core problem. On this side, it's the wasteful use of energy in buildings. That means there's a high energy intensity. And on the other side is that the technology used in buildings are energy inefficient. So we draw arrows between these because we asked why, and then the logic goes in the opposite direction. For each of these ones, the technologies used in buildings are energy inefficient. We ask why again. 
there's a high cost of capital for investment in energy efficiency. And there's another question, why? Well, funders perceive risks of such high investment. So that's why there's a high cost of capital um, for such investments. So the high cost of capital means that technology used are inefficient. And this means that there's a high energy intensity. And then we follow the effect. So these ones are all the cause at the bottom. And these ones at the top here, difficult. The effect of high energy intensity might mean that there's a difficulty to cool buildings to a comfortable temperature and their population health issues. Okay, this is a simplified diagram. But this is sort of the basis of this problem tree. So um, we use this as a way of identifying what the barriers are and then we use to create the future reality tree or the solution tree, which um, looks at addressing each of these um, issues to bring about an alternative, each of these core causes that affect the, um, the core problem that we're trying to address. Right, so um, it's a, little, a few questions now. Alicia, um, you said for the baseline assessment, qualitative information is available. What's your advice for capturing the most um, create information for your step, for this step? Well, the baseline information falls into two different categories. One has to do with um, sort of physical parameters. And for that, we'd usually be looking for quantitative information. We're looking for real hard data. But when it comes to barriers, a lot of barriers have to do with perception. And they have to do with people's understanding and reasoning for why um, they do something or don't do something. Um, and I did that exercise right at the beginning around, ex around exercise, the exercise exercise, really to underline the, the idea that um, we, we need to look beneath the surface to understand um, why something is done or isn't done. Because one of my personal um, uh, issues is around just assuming, of course, that it's awareness that we need, but that actually we need something more than awareness. We need to dig below the surface. But it all has to do with, with behaviors, with why things are done. So it's often is a qualitative. It's qualitative around the perception of barriers. Um, if you think of um, the <clears throat> type of um, situation with um, um, a a bank, for example, um, where the cost of capital is very high, so they're asking a high interest rates. Um, this, in many cases with new technologies, is because of a lack of awareness or knowledge um, or experience for bankers. So this could be a, an awareness type issue. They are real ones and it's a qualitative type of, um, quite type of factor. So, um, so, so that's that um, aspect. I hope, uh, Alicia, I've, I've answered that. A question from Jamal around the using workshops to identify market barriers is useful, but GCF often asks for hard data to document this. Um, how do you reconcile um, between stakeholders, say, and the data available? Well, how do you, I mean, that's, Great question, and we were talking about this morning the need for sort of data. Well, what sort of data is there? What is hard data um, in this sort of case? Um, well, if, for example, it's an issue of awareness in the banking sector, it's possible to do a poll type of approach to understand awareness so that you have some hard data around that factor. Um, in interviews um, and opinions, when one um, analyzes that data in a more sort of an analytical approach to the data, so we don't just say it's the opinion of some, but 40% of people responded in one way or another way to, to justify those sorts of things. Um, it depends to some extent what they are. Um, often for GCF, they're getting more and more um, uh, stringent about science backing the opinions um, that are given in a proposal 
um, there are market oriented studies that one would do um, to, to, to back this up. Um, often though that has to do with the climate data, for example, um, GCF doesn't really take for granted that there's going to be um, warming or sea level rise. We need to provide some more scientific forecast oriented analysis um, for that. Um, Sydney, to what extent, in what way has the COVID-19 pandemic altered the way you approach this process? In our experience now, if it's happening, one is that projects in which there is a requirement for on the site stakeholder consultation um, are being delayed. So we've seen a number of activities that are pushed forward. So that's an unfortunate effect of taking it and pushing it forward. And then we've been using online tools. We find that the engagement with the online tools is partial. It's very difficult to get um, views and insights um, from people. It takes remarkably a lot of work and you're less engaged with the content. Um, so online tools are not sort of a, a, a panacea for it, um, for, for addressing um, this, this issue. We, so we use online meetings and postpone travel. May has asked in what part or how can we incorporate gender principles in the market barrier analysis? Well, we incorporate it all the time um, through all aspects of the market barrier analysis. Um, it would be would have been good, I think, for me to give the illustrations of that, but all of the information that we um, that I presented, we would look for um, gender differentiation within that information. We would be looking uh, at um, understanding the perspective of men and women and the differing perspectives um, on these um, on all of these issues. And it applies just as much out in the field, working with beneficiaries of projects through to um, within a municipality, for example, the management of the municipality. So we're always on the lookout for the, 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 the gender perspective, understanding how men and women experience barriers, market barriers in different ways um, and the implications of that. Ben has asked around um, within impact chain analysis, where and how would the climate models be used um, to inform the analysis. So this is the slide that shows the impact chain. And at the top of um, this slide, we have hazards and at the next level we have the impacts. So the climate models are used a level of um, hazards. Um, principally. Um, and these arrows, they, they give information about these arrows. So we know there's too low precipitation and that means that there is insufficient water. So this is the logical link between the two, the hazards and the impacts. And the climate models are really um, around in this, this aspect of it. What I focused on today really around the barriers is these aspects on the um, aspects of the vulnerability of the system, the characteristics of the system that we are mapping, and the barriers that um, lead to, to, for example, low efficiency of irrigation systems. Well, what are the barriers that lead to that? So how you incorporate a barrier analysis within, within this type of um, impact chain. Um, someone has asked on the chat, what informs the, the market chain analysis? Would it be interviews, review of organizational diagrams, desk-based sources? It's yes, it's all of those. Um, we use um, these tools, interviews, reviews um, throughout, the, um, throughout the market barrier analysis. So the idea of using interviews, reviews, literature reviews, these sorts of things. Workshops um, are an important aspect. But if you can hold workshops, we, use, we do surveys. Um, we find surveys provide some of that rigor that, that Jamal was asking about. Um, measurements in some cases, actually going and measuring things. It depends what the particular issue is and the barriers. If you're saying 
fertility of the soil. There are measurements that can be done around that, um, for example. And pilots. Pilots are a very good way of showing the evidence for a theory of change. If we do one action, then we will get another type of result. So when we get down to understanding the causal links between the activities of the project and the results that it generates, then pilots are, are often used and may be part of feasibility studies as well. I mean, in this diagram, don't, don't assume that these are all linked up, but we might use, we would use for behavioral change analysis, both surveys and semi-structured interviews, for example, some workshops and such like. That's, um, I think, all we have time for. Time is almost up. I wanted to go back to this diagram and say, we are um, so often thinking about what can be done. In this case, a beautiful biogas plant was installed. It worked beautifully. It provided gas. Everyone loved it. But it wasn't something that could be um, uh, distributed in a sustainable market creation way because the market barriers weren't taken into account in that project. So this is the um, this is the idea that um, the um, that, that this would be um, the type of um, change that would be brought about. So that's you know the. The idea that we want to address market barriers to produce a lasting change 